I'm gonna get that. Everybody Doesn't say, it just holds Now it's recording again. I had hit record at five minutes to 12 and haven't touched it since. Oh, well, I guess so you'll find out when you look at the thingy. Sorry if, sorry if there's a huge leap in uh, in the after, aftermath of it all. Um, i would seen that on one of our previous streams as well, where like if that's part of the video, it just like suddenly jumps to a different part of <clears throat> our discussion. But I have to wonder at some point if the streaming server is getting a little overloaded because it seems like they have a lot of Adventist churches on their service, so maybe they're getting a little more than there. But would they have them at this time? I mean, like this is when most. You got to remember, this is go all across the country or across the world. Everybody's in a different time zone. Yeah. <clears throat> Cool, and we can't be the only home church. <laughs> so, that's I hope streaming. not. Oh, these are actual churches that are streaming their services, too. You say yeah. we're not an actual church? Sorry. <laughs> Gotta check my language. I have to you know, these 40 years of traditional not the, thinking. Not on the you tax bracket, I guess, or whatever. Constantly, constantly readjust my thinking. All right, cool. Um, <clears throat> so, just a brief overview of what we talked about. Um, last week we were talking about, I guess, was it things that, um, things that are good indicators that you are ready to get married or that you're like in the right kind of spot, what kind of person you should be. Uh, the first one was, uh, that we, you should both be Christians as a requirement for having proper unity. Um, you know, that seems to be a good base there. Um, second was the responsibility of the man as the head, which we might end up talking a little bit more about as we go. Um, you know, just being a leader. The last one we had time to discuss was being patient, loving, and kind, and kind of went down the attributes of a bishop, um, what somebody who's a leader in the church is supposed to be. And uh, so, so now we're kind of on the last one, which I said was kind of the kind of the bigger topic, I think, of one of the biggest responsibilities of men when it comes to going into marriage or when it comes to um, that kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, and that being that we must be ready to sacrifice, uh, which works both ways, I think. But I think it's a responsibility also laid especially on the man. And, uh, you know, obviously in marriage, everybody makes sacrifices and I guess we call them compromises in some ways. It's not necessarily a great word, I think, to describe it, but... Well, yes, it is. Think about what a sacrifice is. Mm -hmm. If you took an animal to be sacrificed, what was going to happen to him? It was going to be killed. Right. The animal was being offered totally to the Lord. But the Lord says in Scripture to make our, our bodies a living sacrifice, which means we are to be totally committed to Him, but it also implies a total commitment to your spouse. Now there's a lot of people that don't have that kind of commitment. It's not being taught much in society. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it's a foreign term to us, and yet because we don't have any type of sacrifices that we talk about. The only sacrifice we really ever talk about is someone who was in the military who gave their life you yeah. know, in the service type of thing. We don't understand the concept of sacrifice. But Jesus was a willing sacrifice. He chose to offer himself. And in that, I think in that vein, we are to choose, when we get married, we are to choose to offer ourselves in commitment to each other. You're trying to die to self, and if marriage is two becoming one, you still should <laughs> die to yourself. <clears throat> Absolutely. Good point. <clears throat> Selfishness doesn't have any place there, for sure. Selfishness isn't supposed to have a place anywhere. And so I was trying to find as well some, some good examples of people in the Bible who, uh, particularly in, specifically to, towards like marriage, and so I was wanting to see if there were any examples you guys could think of where the Bible kind of paints somebody as being a good husband. Because I feel like there's, you know, we have in the Bible at least the example of Sarah being referred to as an example of a good wife. You know, having been like, you know, a servant to her husband Abraham. 
calling him Lord, it says, right? Um, but I was wondering if you guys could think of any examples of where the Bible says this person was a good husband, or at least is implied. Well, one I can think of right off the top of my head would be um, the father of Samuel, mm -hmm. Alcana, because he had two wives, and and Hannah was barren, and she was praying and asking the Lord when they went up to, for the, uh, the feast, she was praying for a child that she would dedicate to the Lord, and her husband had, had confronted her about her, her distress, and he had given her a double portion of whatever you know, the meal was and everything, and he said, you know, am I not worth more to you than two husbands? You know, or two sons no, or something I like that. Yeah, it's not two sons, yeah. I don't have this <laughs> verse right in front of me, but, you know, she was grieving over the fact that she hadn't borne any children, and the fact that, you know, her husband was trying to console her. That Most men, I don't think, would have taken that approach. You know, he was very tender and compassionate toward her about that issue. That's the only one on top of my head that I can think of that really exhibited that type of strong, warm leadership. Yeah, and I think that that probably is a good example of somebody who was leading in a good way, but not necessarily an example of a good husband because he had two wives. I would say that it, there, to some extent he must have been um, at least a good husband and father because when they had Samuel, they raised him up until she took him to the temple to leave him there with um, Eli. Mm -hmm. Well, the fact that he was raised in an atmosphere of serving the Lord, I think, spoke well about both parents' commitment to raising him with that in mind, that he was the Lord's property, that he belonged to God. Mm -hmm. So I'd say Elkanah must have been at least a godly man that way. Yeah. There's Boaz. Oh, yeah. 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 That's a good example, too. Mm -hmm. And it shows his level of responsibility as well because he still took appropriate legal precaution before committing to anything mm -hmm. with Ruth. Um, he was said, you know, there's someone before me who is a kinsman redeemer, you know, and I will will ask him first, and if he doesn't want to perform the, that duty, then, then I'll do it. So I think it's really good as well. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, he became one of the ancestors of Jesus. Yeah, wild. That's pretty pretty telling when you think Jesus about that. Jesus has a very crazy ancestry. <laughs> Especially in the case of Ruth <laughs> because she was a Moabitess. Yeah. And the Moabites were a very godless they were they were, were one, they of, one the of the chief, daughters of Lot's children. I think that was. Yeah. Okay. But but the, but the Moabites were one of the chief in child sacrifices. Okay. You know, giving their firstborn to Baal. They were very big on that. There's a, I think James Dobson went to one of the cities over in the Middle East that used to be a Moabite capital of some sort. He said there's a stone altar there. And he said down in between the rocks you can find all kinds of little bones, you know, bones of children, babies. And he said it was heartbreaking to see that. It was a testament to that society that felt the children were expendable and he took that to the abortion issue. Uh, Ingrid says Jacob was a good husband to Rachel, despite the fact that they'd been deceived. He'd been deceived. Yeah. <clears throat> I think too Noah and uh, certainly maybe one or two, and one or two of his sons. Uh, the very fact that his wife was never really mentioned so much, I and mean, some people think that uh, she's not even really mentioned, is she? No. Uh, okay. Just kind of in passing, but uh, um, she had to feel confident in him to be able to follow along with his dude building a giant boat. To follow and even get on the boat. So that would make her also a good example of a good wife. <clears throat> oh, absolutely. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we tend to forget that uh, Noah was unprecedented and as the Lord called him, you know, perfect, uh, a man of righteousness and whatnot. Um, he he was the last man standing, if you will. <laughs> yeah. And uh, when you think of, of trying to be his spouse, trying to support him and love him and, and he 
he's doing this crazy thing. When he is, is has bucked all of society. And, uh, I think to Abraham, you know, Abraham, um, he, he and uh, Sarah didn't have any children for all those years. And it was only at her insistence that he considered using her concubines to produce children. You know, in that society, it would have been perfectly acceptable for him to have taken other wives in that day. And yet, all those years, he stayed committed to just her, and he didn't do that until she pushed him into it. Yeah. That says something about commitment there, that he was, you know, that he stayed. Okay, I'll <laughs> yeah. take a second wife. Do you insist? But, but, <laughs> but I'm saying, when you, when, you, when you look at that, the fact, in that society, to have been childless yeah. was considered a sign of dishonor or that God wasn't favoring yeah. you. And here they are, this incredibly wealthy and prosperous family right. that doesn't have any. And he hadn't, he hadn't done those things. You know, I wonder what kind of a witness it would have been had he said, no, I'm staying faithful to you and we'll see how God works this out. Right, he trusted. Yeah. an amazing testament. He trusted it because God had told him that the promised seed will come through you. Right. Yeah. Which is funny because I watched a sermon where someone was pointing out that mm -hmm. the Bible calls Abraham uh, the man of faith. And he says when you just read Abraham's story, though, he was constantly doubting and asking God questions. It was like when God told him he was going to have his kid, he was like, I'm too old, you know, like, we're already past that. How's that going to work? And God was like, just trust me. He was like, all right. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, saying, in, that, in that society, for him to have been that age and not had children. Yeah. It's like, well, it's yeah, like, I understood him questioning God, but I also think it, it was unique that he didn't take on all the other ways of the world of his day, you know. It's interesting, too, is that, uh, you know, when he left Haran, he was 75 years old when he headed toward the Promised Land, so to speak. And you, you may remember that when he got down close uh, to Egypt, um, he was f fearful that they, uh, since Sarah was so beautiful, that they were going to take her yeah. And kill him. So she became Imagine his wife. Became, an eighty-year-old woman because she was pretty. His wife, yeah, his wife must have been incredibly beautiful to still be. <laughs> to be pretty at eighty. gorgeous at 70, 70 or, so. or sixty or seventy years old. Yeah, I think she was ten years old. Yeah, yeah, everyone really was. There are seven, people that age who do 65. age beautifully. Yeah. You know, but. so she would have been sixty-five. But um, and of course they lived to be like. Um, he lived to be 175, so they weren't even really in their prime, I guess, at that point. <laughs> they were middle-aged almost. Yeah, not even middle-aged. But um, he considered her, it was, it was the relationship as, as husband and wife was kind of detrimental. That's, that's what he was looking at. If they think that you are my wife, they're going to kill me because they want you. So just tell them. You're my sister, right? Um, so, obviously, he wasn't trusting God uh, completely then, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. He 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 was doing what he you know he had falling back on some kind of logic. It seemed to make I guess appropriate logical sense. May have been too. He was older and didn't think he could defend himself or her. What at seventy five? Yeah. He may have felt that he wasn't strong enough to defend himself. Well, I mean, against. he had like a small army, didn't he? Because he went and recaptured all of Lot's stuff. Well, that was later, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, you're talking about when they started when their they journey. When they first started across, their journey yeah. to to, uh, to the Promised Land. I just, I'm just, I'm just saying that obviously becoming uh, the uh, appropriate husband is not something that's instantaneous. Yeah. Or something that you even start with, it's something that you grow into uh, as you learn and, and so forth, um, as you mature. You would think by 75 you'd be pretty mature, but uh, apparently not. <laughs> but um, it's just yeah. interesting when you look at Abraham's life. I mean, obviously they they had a they were successful throughout their marriage, and, and of course Isaac came along, and you know the whole thing played out the way. God uh, was planning for it too, but it is interesting along the way to see the choices and decisions people make. Um, 
And we're only catching just a couple little snippets. Yeah, I mean. So, how about an example of a of a husband who sacrifices for his wife? Well, I think of Joseph in the New Testament. Joseph. Well. Remember, Mary was found to be pregnant before they oh, that got Joseph. together. That Joseph. I went to Joseph in Egypt. I was yeah, like, so I in don't the New follow, Testament. but yeah. <laughs> um, you know, she, he, he had every legal right and every moral right to divorce her and cancel the marriage agreement because it appeared she'd been unfaithful. And when he had that dream that told him that she was, you know, conceived, she'd conceived through the Holy Spirit, such a strange thing to have happen and to live with that for the rest of his life. You know, when he takes her as his wife, the community naturally thinks, well, they've been fooling around before marriage. And he has to live with that and be faith. And he, but he was faithful to her and took her as his wife and took care of her. I'd say that, that, that to me, that's the only one I can think of off my mm -hmm. top of my head that to have treated her, treated her tenderly and to have believed this miraculous thing that had never happened in history before. Well, an angel, or he was holding yeah. a dream, wasn't right. he? Yeah, exactly. I mean, so he was made aware. Otherwise made aware, but how many of us would, would take that life-altering step over a dream? I don't know. I mean, most of the dreams that are talked about in the Bible are apparently something that just sticks with people, like for a really long time and they can't stop thinking Something about it. Something you definitely wake up remembering because yeah. most of our dreams we don't remember. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. Like I remember that I had a really interesting dream last night but I have no idea what it was. That's all I remember about it was it was interesting. And that happens to me really often so when I think of like dreams and stuff at least. Did you have some examples there that you wanted to... Yeah, no, Jacob. One. Jacob? Yeah. I sacrificed, uh, sacrificed like seven years. Oh. Yeah. yeah, that's a good example, Actually, too. 14 years. 14 years, yeah. Yeah, so he gave up a, a what I would consider to be a sizable chunk of his life. Mm -hmm. Almost a quarter. For the, well, depending on how At least long for our lifetime. Yeah. Almost a quarter of our lifetime. No, Jake, Jacob lived to be uh, close to 135 or 40. So if I could take Yeah, so what's 14 years? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the Bible does say that I mean, it seemed to him as nothing. When did that happen? I know. <laughs> But one, another example I had as well, um, I think that's a great example, was uh, Hosea. Um, oh, yeah, he's second. Being somebody who very consistently sacrificed, in a way. Um, you know, not only, I would say, his reputation as taking Gomer, but also uh, monetarily and with his time and everything else. He was literally completely invested in that marriage. And I would say the number one example mm -hmm. would have to be Adam. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, well, the number number one human example, anyways. Right. Well, I mean, from from his perspective, he pretty much gave up the entire world. Yeah. Or, uh, for Eve. And that he did. Yeah. And everybody and, after him. And of course, it, that I was, I was always had wondered, you know, that that seemed kind of illogical to do that um, when you could just say to God, just make me another one. You know, let's let's have another. Here's I got plenty of ribs. But let's make me another one. <laughs> you know, make me another one. But then when you start to think about it, it was because she was, I mean, what made it so difficult is that she was his second self. Mm -hmm. I mean, biologically, you couldn't have anybody, she was a clone. But, but God tweaked the hormones a bit yeah. and made Changed her distinctly, yeah, distinctly a female. So you couldn't have any closer mm -hmm. biological mm -hmm. link in terms of, of being so su well suited for one another and having such incredible reform. So that, that makes the, the choice all that much more difficult. But but obviously he was willing to give up everything. Absolutely. And of course, you know, the 
obviously the, the, the step further is the one that everybody would be familiar with, which was Christ's sacrifice for all of the humanity. Church. Yeah, the Being the obviously the most, the most dominant. Um, the most, that'd be the most significant anyway. Yeah. Uh, the fact that he gave a part of what made him God to do it. When you understand the full extent of it. Certainly. And so I think, um, I think this is one of the prime examples of uh, what, like, what a man has to have in mind about marriage. Is because you know again we were talking about the myths and how we just have this very flowery expectation of marriage, but you know I think um, I think in a very serious way man's responsibility to his wife is to sacrifice. Um, and depending on which example you want to look at, you know, people sacrificed either very significant things or minimal things, but nonetheless, um, they were sacrificing. Christ, obviously, being the ultimate one, um, being our ultimate example, you know, he gave his life. I mean, it's, uh, which scripture is it that says that? Um, you know, he gave his life for, for the church, his bride. So I think it's the same. To well, us. Ephesians chapter five, one and two talks yeah. about it, uh, him loving us so much that he, he was a sacrifice and an offering. Mm -hmm. And the Adam and Eve, um, with his sacrifice too, also would have been an example of what Christ would do, giving up everything yeah. for the bride. Yeah. yeah, a lot of parallel there. Yeah. Um. Yeah, there's the verse you were talking about, um, Ephesians 5, 2, And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. And so physical and, physical and uh, spiritual sacrifice. You know, I think most people today go into marriage with the idea that this is someone who makes me feel good. I'm marrying someone who makes me feel good, who makes me happy. They don't go into it unselfishly with the thought of pleasing the other person. And I, you know, we've got a whole society that's built around self-serving. So it's really hard to see examples in today's world of marriages built around self-sacrifice. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of talk about in the, within the Christian circles about the man being the head of the household and women submit to them. Well, a woman who feels that she's loved with a self-sacrificing love would submit and be as, as self-sacrificing as she could be. But women who feel they are being bossed and domineered will push back. Mm -hmm. And so the men who think that by being the boss it means ordering them around and being in control and being obsessively controlling, have no idea what that kind of self-sacrificing love is like. Yeah. So the man is just really following after the example of Christ. Yeah. Should be. It should be. And so to, to continue along that thought, Ephesians 5, um, 21, <clears throat> and reading on through there, we'll hit a couple of these passages because they're nice. Um, Wait for you guys to get there if you like. Ingrid said, mentioned here that Jacob loved Rachel with all his heart, which is an important element. Yeah. Some men love their wives with all their lust. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I think it's, um, it's, it's a, it's a subject that's so deep and difficult to explain because when you consider the deepness of God's love for us and he says that basically he's wanting us to experience that on a personal level with each other you know like the kind of relationship he has with him within him with it you know in himself that kind of thing and trying to mm -hmm. put that into words doesn't really seem possible but it does seem to just basically come down to the concept of sacrifice, you know. But so it's I think it's sacrifice, and it's also commitment. 
You know, the commitment is, is the other term that isn't, isn't uh, focused on in today's world. Yeah. Because, you know, people change, change partners like crazy. Well, I think part of the reason is because people make commitments to people. Too soon. And people especially. change. Not even that. Just like the fact that like our marriage vows that we take, um, you know, aren't taken seriously is sad. I don't think any vows, any, any contract that's made in today's society is taken seriously. Yeah. We're in a disposable age, and I think marriages have become disposable as well. Yeah, well, I mean, we have marriages that are disposable, and now we have children that are disposable. Yeah, yeah started from the foundation. And so. the, way the, the way the devil destroys the fabric of society is to destroy the family. So we'll pick apart these, uh, these two different instances. Uh, the first one's in Ephesians 5, um, 21 there, which I think is probably a, an important base, baseline, let's say, for... For it says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. You know, I think that's an important thing. Of course, specifically, I believe it's talking about, like, brothers and sisters in faith. But, I mean, we are, even even with our partners, we are brothers and sisters. So I think that applies. Um, you know, and that idea of submitting to each other, you know, I think the simplest example would be, like, if me and Elsa wanted to eat out somewhere and I wanted to eat Chinese and she wanted Italian or something then I think as the man we would go for Italian (laughs) (laughs) yeah I mean I think that's part of sacrifice because like I said I think that's part of the man's responsibility is to forego the things he wants so to speak to please uh, the person but if she's equally submitting and self-sacrificing, then, then it becomes this Chinese. battle. No, let's go Chinese. And you'll yeah. be 10 minutes trying to figure out where to go and eat. Elijah would eat anything, so. Yeah, <laughs> well, whatever you want. You know. <laughs> whatever for him. Whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the smart thing to do would be mm-hmm. the compromise. You, you could say, uh, well, sweetie, today we'll go ahead and have Italian, but next time we go, we'll have Chinese. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she would be fine with that. Yeah. I'll be like, but I want to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it's, you know, it, it, I think that's a very simple form of sacrifice, let's say. You know, you're just giving up something you want uh, for something she wants. And the bottom line is unselfishness. The yeah. You know, when you put yourself aside to think of the other person, that is the true submission in the godly sense, is putting someone else first. Well, it also says it's submitting to one another, or to, yeah, to one another, uh, in the fear of God. Right. And Proverbs talks about the fear of God being the, the hatred of evil, or hating evil. So, I mean, you're, you're both committing to, to hate evil. Let's hate evil together, sweetheart. <laughs> well, it's not just in the, like, submitting to one another in the fear of God means that you would have that self-sacrificing spirit. You know, that, you, that doesn't mean the submission of being a doormat and, and inviting someone to walk over you. It means I respect you so much. I respect your judgment, your evaluation of things. So, you know, I yield to your wishes because I respect your viewpoint. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, it goes on to say, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. You know, so, you know, we've kind of talked about that before, that idea of submission and headship and leadership. And I've seen a lot of men in the church over the years quote 522 Hmm. and never quote 525. (laughs) Yeah, and and so that's that's obviously Hmm. the next part that everyone gets to. Um, 24 and 25 there says therefore as the church is subject unto Christ so let the wives be uh, to their own husbands and everything husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle 
or any such thing that it should be uh, holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. Yeah. So, I mean, it's... It, it's Egotistical, a, man. Yeah. You love your wife, you love yourself, <laughs> man. But yeah, the... You uh, love yourself. You know, I think there's a lot to that, because I think the hard thing is that for most people, there's usually a disconnect on one side of this or the other. And... You know, either the husband doesn't want to sacrifice for the wife, or the wife doesn't want to submit herself to the husband. And, um, you know, a lot of people, I think, have a problem trying to be the first to initiate this on either side. You know? And I mean, to, like, like you know, what do you guys think that looks like? You know, like, what is... What the not mean? sacrificing, or the sacrificing and the submitting? The, yeah, like, what do you think it means for you to submit to your husband as a wife, or what do you think it means for your husband to love and give yourself for your wife? Well, I think as a wife, it's a sign of respect and admiration to accede to what your husband wants to do. Unless he's wanting to do something evil, you know, it's kind of, uh, I just think it's a sign of respect, you know, that, that he, I know my husband's a much better decision maker in a lot of areas than I am. He can, he can make a decision about what car to buy, where well, I'm just clueless, you know, it's got four tires, the key, turn, you turn the key, it goes, that's all I care about. But he knows, he knows below the surface. He knows whether it's worth getting or <laughs> what are you looking at? No, no, a possibly. broken car. You want to see all the, all the cars out there? <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's a huge part of it is, um, and probably the hardest part. Like, I think we are, we are both given huge responsibilities to each other that are way out of most everyone's comfort zone. Yeah. Because men are, they tend, we tend to be more egocentric and more focused on us. And more analytical. And more analytical. And women yeah. tend to be more emotional and... and interpersonal. And, uh, and, but the man could be the head of the house and the woman the heart of the house. You know, because the woman is the one that usually raises the children and nurtures them and, and influences the next generation. Yeah. In a much more profound way than, than the father does. Well, one of the interesting things is that uh, one of the things, and I think we read it in Titus, maybe, was that another responsibility of the man is to run the household and to raise the children in a, well, at least in terms of their education or godly responsibilities. Not There's to say definitely that the a spiritual have a responsibility for the, for the man that we don't ever talk much about in society. Yeah. Because, you know, you, in Deuteronomy, it says fathers... Speak unto your sons and daughters and teach them these things when you rise up, when you sit down, when you're walking by the way. It doesn't say mothers. It says yeah. fathers. You know, that men are to do this teaching spiritual lessons to their children. And boy, that's a, that's a lost art in today's society. I think teaching in general You look at most churches, 75% women, 25% men. Not very many men in, in churches because... Let's start teaching not, men how to be men. It's not cool anymore, you know. Religion is for women. That's what some, some men think, you know. And <laughs> men are too manly for that. I would say that being submissive is also like a voluntary <laughs> thing and not force. Yes. So just like we're supposed to like serve Christ, also like serve our husbands. In a way. You ask, you know, what does it look like? I mean... It looks like the plan of salvation. I mean, marriage is an illustration of the atonement. Yeah. <clears throat> two becoming one. And uh, with sacrifice being the main element that's at play. You know? And so, I mean, any marriage really is just a microcosm of the plan of salvation. I mean, that's really what, what Paul is saying here. He's, he's liking it to, you know, marriage to the... the uh, the Christ role that the Christ church. had to play with the church. So. Oh yeah, well, I mean, and that's, that's why, why it's under attack. That's why the marriage is under attack. It, it's a target because 
It's a microcosm of the plan of salvation and an illustration of the atonement. So, I mean, even even when a marriage is consummated, you know, the man covers the wife. That's that's what atonement is. It's the covering. You see. So I mean, it's 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 just playing out. I forget exactly where. The two is. becoming one in that concept in scripture can only be done with a mutual submission. Yeah. You know, because two becoming one, ha you know, we're two unique people, so there has to be a mutual decision to subordinate what I want to what, what benefits want. you. Yeah, there's a bunch yeah. of stuff that goes into it. Not only all of that, but you have stuff like sacrificing doubt for your wife or she being submissive and being truthful and stuff. But you have things like that, too, to actually have trust as well. Yeah, and that's why I said it's an interestingly huge topic because, you like I said, most, most people you believe in most people aren't comfortable for some reason or another with with certain aspects of this. And I mean, I've seen it in different people's relationships over the years of wives who don't want to be submissive to their husbands and husbands who don't want to be loving and sacrificing for their wives. You know, and like I said, usually it's it's one person at least not wanting to do their part in it. And, you know, the Bible, for example, says uh, <laughs> that, uh, that to be in a house with a nagging wife is like a continual dripping. <laughs> and nothing is more annoying than a faucet that won't stop dripping. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, but, but it's that kind of thing where, where I think it's, it, it's hard for, for everybody because, I mean, it seems like like, you know, the wife's responsibility is not to be a doormat or anything, but it's to willingly and voluntarily choose to be subordinate, so to speak, to the man, as Christ <coughs> chose to do with his father. Yeah. You know? Marriage is a, a very much a, supposed to be a spiritual thing as, as the dominant driving force. And I think our society a long time ago changed it to a materialism driven uh, type of, of process. Uh, even in the materialistic realm there can be cooperation but typically it falls apart. Uh, if it doesn't have the spiritual element it definitely is vulnerable and that's why we have so much divorce um, in our uh, society today. And I think that's what the, where the scriptures are trying to what they're trying to emphasize that there's the spiritual element that has to be at play because it is an example of, of the plan of salvation. Um, but we've materialized it. And we think that, you know, it's, it's the American dream. If you, you get married, you know, you, you, have, you get some jobs, you get a house, you have some kids. And then the race you know. is on to accumulate stuff. Well, that comes automatically, in a sense. The more people you put in a, a home, the more, the more stuff you're going to accumulate. But then there's the challenges of, you know, educating them. Well, nowadays, uh, it seems like most parents are content with letting somebody else educate the children. If they, they've just kind of come totally apart from Scripture in that regard. Um, but look where it all leads. You know, look where, you know, especially the higher education aspect of it. Look where it all takes you. It, it takes this out of the equation totally. It's puts it out here. And so you have this, this secular society And not only does it put it develops, away, it actually attacks it. Yeah, so you have the secular society that develops all it's based on, on fire. stuff that you can accumulate. And if you have more stuff than the neighbor, then you're successful. And then the neighbor says, oh, i got to keep up with the Joneses. The Joneses. So it's just this vicious cycle of nonsense. Yeah. So the last chunk of scripture we'll read is in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and uh, it's a pretty good little bit there, but we'll just kind of read through it and briefly discuss it, and because uh, I think it, it kind of says the same kind of stuff, but just goes a little more mm -hmm. in depth in different directions. Corinthians. Chapter 7. <laughs> And it's kind of, it kind of addresses a handful of issues because I guess the people at Corinth had some questions for 
for Paul oh, about Corinth marriage. Corinth had some serious questions about marriage in the family. Mm. Yeah. Maybe we ought to look at chapter 7 next week. That's where yeah, I guess we could do that. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, 107. It's so, because it looks like the whole chapter is, is about marriage. And there's a whole lot of good stuff to here. discuss, too. Mm -hmm. Mark is going here. Yeah, yeah, so we can discuss that next. Even going in chapter 8 and 9, you know, pattern of self denial, chapter 9 is. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I think the, the, the main element within a marriage has to be sacrifice. So that was a good good, uh, good focus today. Offer yourself a living sacrifice. Yeah. Romans 12, 2, I think it is. Like that, yeah. You present your body as a living sacrifice. Yeah. All right, well, we will close out our study time in prayer then. And we'll pick it up next, uh, next time. Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day you've given us that uh, you've allowed us to rest and relax and enjoy the beauty of your creation. We thank you for marriage and for all the beauty that you've put in it and ask that you would help us all to have marriages that are harmonious and unified and that you would help us all to achieve the goal of marriage, to be in love uh, for our whole lives and to sacrifice for each other and to submit to each other and to love each other the best we know how. Help us to put aside all those little issues that we have and to love each other completely. And help us to accomplish your mission and your calling for us and our lives. And uh, bless the food and the time that we have together as well as a family. Bless those who are watching online with us also. And bless their marriages um, in that way as well. And, uh, we thank you so much for all these wonderful things. And we, of course, thank you for the ultimate sacrifice your son gave for us. This we ask and pray in the name of your Son. Amen. Amen. <coughs> All right, well, thanks for joining us again, folks. Uh, we uh, trust that it's been a blessing to you today and that uh, your lives and your marriages will be strengthened somewhat. And uh, we pray that you'll catch up with us again next week, same place, same time. Till then, have a great day.